On this edition of Lakeville City Limits, we take a look back at the origins of one of the most popular parks in town and find out how, of all things, a horse contributed to its success. Then Crime Prevention Officer Kevin O'Neill joins me to talk about the things you can do to help keep Lakeville safe. And finally, we learn about one of the newest wineries in the state in another edition of Cellar Notes. Hello, I'm City Administrator Steve Melke. Welcome to City Limits, Lakeville's public information program. The Lakeville Historical Society works to preserve the past by collecting memorabilia and memories of Lakeville in their new home located in the Heritage Center. Everyone should come out and take a look at Lakeville's past. In addition to the many displays, you can also view some historical videos. So on today's show, we thought we would highlight an old video originally created back in 1997 about the history of Antlers Park. Antlers Park, located on the shores of Lake Marion in Lakeville, Minnesota, is today a popular summertime destination for people throughout the area. The shoreline is dotted with shelters and picnic tables, and frolicking children can usually be found. But in the park's early days, there was a clubhouse, a huge bathhouse, and a beautiful dance pavilion. Big band music filled the air, and the park attracted huge crowds from throughout the Twin Cities. The story of Antlers Park begins when a successful Minneapolis businessman, who was best known as owner of the world's most famous horse, decided to go into the railroad business. Marion Willis Savage had been a farmer in Iowa before moving to Minneapolis in 1886. He wanted to run his own business, and at the age of 27, he founded the International Stock Food Company. Thanks in part to his flamboyant advertising techniques, his business grew quickly. Soon, the slogan, three feeds for one cent, was known not only across the country, but around the world. His name, Marion Savage, would become as equally well-known after 1902, the year that he purchased world-class pacing horse, Dan Patch, for $60,000. Dan Patch would become the most successful pacer of his generation, recording a world record for the mile at the 1906 Minnesota State Fair. His time, one minute, 55 seconds, would remain a record for over 30 years. And Savage was looking for a way to link his business operations in Minneapolis with his farm to the south. To this end, a partnership was formed with William B. Mason, a gentleman from the East, and on June 10, 1905, construction began on the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, and Dubuque Railroad, soon to be known simply as the Dan Patch Line. It is said that Savage originally envisioned the line extending all the way to New Orleans, but the line would eventually stop at Northfield, after the town of Faribault refused to allow it right-of-way. As construction on the railroad continued, it occurred to Savage that an amusement park along the route might draw people from the city. He needed a location that would be pleasant, yet not too far out. He chose a spot along the shores of Prairie Lake in the town of Lakeville. Marion Savage essentially purchased farmland on a lake that was an appropriate distance from the Twin Cities to build his park. Uh, that he could bring picnickers and, and day trippers out to uh, for the purposes of, of gaining uh, riders on his on his train. When he was building this, it was the realization, the experience of Lake Marion that he there weren't any other lakes along this line uh, that were pristine as this one was back then. I think that was it was a circumstance that Jesus is really nice here. Park construction began in 1908. To help promote his new park in typical savage style, he had the name of Prairie Lake changed to Lake Marion. The lake had been a popular feeding spot for elk and deer, and thus the new park was christened Antlers Park and was scheduled to open in 1910. In the summer of 1910, William H. Taft was president. The world was at peace, and Antlers Park was ready to open. For people riding the train from Minneapolis, the trip began at the depot at 54th and Nicollet. 
The cost was 45 cents. And the train, hailed by Savage as the world's first gas electric passenger train, rumbled out of the station and into the countryside at speeds approaching 55 miles per hour. The trip to Antlers Park took about 45 minutes. Passenger comfort was a major concern for Savage, and thus deeply cushioned leather seats were used, and passengers were assured that owing to the superior construction and well-ballasted roadbed, the maximum amount of safety is assured with unusual steadiness and smoothness in riding. At Antlers Park, extra track was laid so that passengers could disembark right inside the park. There was just a stub that went right in towards where Shelter A is located now. It backed in there and stopped, and people just disembarked, and off to the park they went. So. Once inside the park, there were a variety of activities to choose from. There was a bathing house that had 250 changing rooms in it, and there was a boat dock that had uh, sailboats and, and rowboats and canoes all for rent, a big, long dock for them. There were pavilions around the grounds for people to have uh, picnics in and kitchens in. There was a miniature railroad for taking uh, children on rides in the park. There were baseball diamonds in this huge aerial swing. We don't know how long it operated, but it was a tall structure that could be seen for quite a long ways. And Marion Savage took one of the trains, uh, the Augurita, which was a small engine that wasn't very efficient for pulling many cars out on excursions. And he side railed it at Antlers Park. And because it was an electric generating engine, it was gasoline generated electricity he strung lights through the trees and on the exteriors of the buildings as well as the interiors of the building and, and on all over this uh, tall aerial swing and then at night he lit the park now this was in 1912 if you can imagine hardly anywhere was there electricity in 1912 in minneapolis and st paul rural electrification didn't come till much later and the towns around didn't have much for electricity at that point. And yet here's this park all lit up at night uh, with electric lights, arc lights, and, and uh, incandescent lights. The clubhouse advertised splendid meals at a nominal price, served at all hours, and featured fruits it received daily from area farms and fish straight out of Lake Marion. For daring souls, there was a huge water slide known as the chute that dumped riders right into the lake. And of course they had great fun with this tall, tall uh, wooden structured slide that uh, they called the chute, the water chute that was there at Antlers Park. And, and that was the chief attraction. No, it was great going down, but if you're I'm no good in heights. It was awful hard getting up to it. But it was just wonderful. You slid, you know, just as fast as could be right on into the water. The park's centerpiece was an old barn which had been converted into the park's dance pavilion. Well, the dance pavilion was 30 feet wide and I believe it was 140 feet long and it had a polished wooden floor and they say that often there were uh, Japanese lanterns hanging from the ceiling. They had porches around three sides of it for people to cool off and, and sit on when they were not dancing. And it, there was a refreshment stand inside. And uh, so it was a, and there was a 12 piece orchestra that played for dances in there. And the way they got financing from it was they charged 10 cents for a dance ticket and then you could dance three dances on a 10 cent dance ticket. <laughs> the fashion for the day at the park in 1910 was a little different than today, especially for the ladies. The ladies had sort of a standard costume that was a white embroidered long dress and a nice, a large hat with flowers on it probably 
and this little lingerie dress was pretty standard uh, dress for women almost of all ages. Now, the very much older ladies might wear a long black skirt and a white blouse, but this was picnic apparel, uh, something that you might uh, expect to see on a bride today, a, a simple dress. Antlers Park enjoyed great success in its early years. By 1912, the railroad utilized 12 passenger cars, each seating 91 people, and had 19 scheduled stops to the park each day throughout the summer. But by 1916, the world was no longer at peace, and the course of Antlers Park history was about to change. On July 12, 1916, while in the hospital for minor surgery, Marion Savage died. He was 57 years old. Ironically, his beloved Dan Patch had died just one day earlier. With Savage gone, much of his financial empire started to unravel, and many of his holdings had to be sold, including Antlers Park. Antlers Park was purchased in 1918 by George O'Rourke, who hoped to continue the park in its grand tradition. O'Rourke, who was described as a sturdy Irishman, is given credit for devising the method of lighting the park in the Savage era. O'Rourke made several improvements to the park, including the addition of a nine-hole golf course in 1927, which would become 18 holes in the 30s. The course was very popular and featured sand greens. Under O'Rourke, the park maintained its early success throughout the 1920s. But by 1930, the Depression and a decline in passenger train traffic due to the increasing use of automobiles led to a decline in the popularity of rural amusement parks in general. At that period, the traffic on the railroad, the passenger traffic was dropping because the automobile was becoming uh, much uh, more widely used and the roads were becoming better. And passenger traffic did continue on the railroad until 1942, uh, but it had dwindled greatly. And so the character of the park changed. It was no longer an excursion. Everybody get on the railroad, go out to the park for the day and come back. But though the crowds weren't quite as large, Antlers Park survived and continued to provide great times. And we were about, at that time, we were about 16, 17, and of course we took all the picnics in. <laughs> we went in dancing and with the girls and we'd tell the girls, geez, uh, my dad owns a big uh, station up here, so and so, and how are you doing? <laughs> So we were just young guys, you know, having a big time out there. You could watch the dancers. And a lot of people that didn't dance enjoyed, you know, older people that came would wander along. But kids liked to go and peek in, and they'd also check up on who was out there in the dark. So <laughs> and often we were told to come in because we were tattling about who was having a little kiss and hugging and stuff going on out. We had friends that was a, a publisher of a newspaper, and uh, he knew Stass and Governor Stass, and so he introduced me. And I thought, boy, I'm shaking hands with the governor of Minnesota. <laughs> George O'Rourke sold the park in 1939, and over the next 35 years, the park would change ownership several times. Several attempts at revitalizing the park were made, but the park was never able to achieve its early glory. One by one, the park's attractions disappeared. Metal from the old carousel was melted and contributed to the war effort. The golf course was plowed in 1942 and turned into a farm field. The old pavilion, which was used briefly during the 1940s as a skating rink, came down in 1951. The park continued to be popular for special events and picnics through the 1950s and 1960s and drew a crowd of over 10,000 for a General Mills picnic in 1972. But more and more, the park was acquiring a local flavor, and in 1974, it was purchased by the city of Lakeville. Shortly after purchasing the park, the clubhouse building was raised, except for a small pavilion that extended from its north end. And in 1980, when this small pavilion too came down, nothing was left from the old park.
Today's Antler Park has its own personality. There are a variety of recreational activities available, and for those looking for relaxation, the beauty of the Lake Marion sunset awaits. But in subtle ways, the city of Lakeville has attempted to keep the memory of Antlers Park alive. The walkways are in close proximity to the original ones. The picnic pavilion A was built on the same spot as the old clubhouse. It's sad that those kind of things have disappeared, but what's, what's really unique is that, you know, the, the city owns the park, the history is there, it's been memorialized forever. Otherwise, the old park survives only in photos and the memories of those who remember it. There was always something going on there, you know. There was either a band playing or something, and gee, that made you feel, you know, just good. Old Antlers Park is gone, but according to some, if you listen carefully, you might occasionally hear some echoes from the past. And now it's time for Hank and Ed. Today's story, how to save water. I like to keep the water running whilst I brush my teeth. No! Always turn your water off when you brush your teeth. Oh. I enjoy keeping the hose running when I'm washing and drying my car. No! You should use the hose only for rinsing. Best of all, I like to run the tap till the water runs cold. No! Just keep a pitcher of water in the refrigerator, you pig! Don't be a water hog. Use water wisely. Joining me today is Kevin O'Neill, Crime Prevention Officer with the Lakeville Police Department. Kevin, thanks for joining me on City Limits. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. I said you're the Crime Prevention Officer for the City of Lakeville. What is that? Well, what we do at the Police Department, like many other police departments in communities like this, it's not always about enforcement, writing tickets, or even being reactive to people's calls to the police. There's a certain number of things that a police department tries to do to communicate and outreach to people maybe before they need the police. Teach them ways to be safe and teach them how to look after their neighborhood. Um, so that's part of what I do. I coordinate all of our outreach programs and our prevention programs at the police department. It's got a wide variety of things. We work on things uh, related to businesses, business safety and security. We go talk to neighborhood groups and help them with ways, the traditional crime watch programs. We run programs like the safety camp in conjunction with the park and rec department. And in a lot of times, it's just getting out and meeting people, being there in that accessible point that if they have questions or issues that they want to discuss at length with someone at the police department, it's kind of a first place they can turn. And I've heard over and over from the police chief that the, the best source of information that, that a police department has is its residents, its business owners, and them being conscious of what they need to know. Well, and absolutely, and it goes both ways. When we can show people and work with folks on ways that they can better safeguard themselves or their neighborhood, that makes them tougher targets for crime. On the other side, if there is a problem or there is an issue going on in their neighborhood or maybe their business district, those folks are the ones that are there all the time. They're the ones that has eyes in that community all the time, even more so than a patrolman passing through. So they're usually the first ones to notice these things. And if they combine that, that sense that they get when they see something that's not right with being able to reach out to us, that really makes it very effective 
for us to do our job as police officers. The technical term is a suspicion call. Absolutely. So what is a suspicion call? Well, it's anything that's not right for that particular area. And in a lot of ways, you kind of have to ask folks what's not right for your neighborhood. And that's an open-ended question. But what you get is examples where, where you have people who live there, they work there, they know what belongs on that street. They know what happens in that parking lot because they're there. They've seen it. They've worked there. So when something out of the ordinary shows up, maybe it's an odd person, maybe it's an odd automobile parked for a period of time, um, anything like that, a strange package, those are the things that people should take notice of. And if it's something that after they take notice and they give it that second glance, it still doesn't seem right, we always invite them to call us. You're not bothering the police department by calling us. We're happy to come out and help you with these things. So Kevin, what are some of the things that you do or work with to help people understand crime prevention and, and making their, their area safer? Well, one of the first things that, that I do throughout the city is I do neighborhood and community meetings. Sometimes it's speaking with a handful of people um, at a residence, kind of a residence meeting. Sometimes it's a situation where we go out and talk to a homeowners association or a business group. But we get together and there's a number of different programs and presentations that I do. They kind of give them tips, tips on ways that they can secure their home, things they can look for that might be suspicious, uh, ways to contact the police and times when maybe they should contact the police. We also work with the business groups in our city. We've got programming that we do for banks, for robbery prevention and safety in the banks. We have other things that we do for businesses to try and teach them to better secure their property or even be on the lookout for shoplifters or people with bad checks and financial fraud. So it's a lot of different areas of programming that, that we try to put together and share this information with everybody so again they can do a better job of looking after themselves and giving us that call when they need us. And you're using the term we so I assume that while you're the coordinator you're not the total crime prevention unit for the city of Lakeville. Well I like to think that we have a, a, a big staff and that everybody in the police department participates in this. Um, as a coordinator, as the crime prevention officer, I am a one-man show but what happens is we pair up, I pair up with many of the other officers and the staff members of our department. And it's a collective effort because each and every time we have a contact with a citizen, whether that's going and taking a report somewhere or maybe you walk into that business to buy a soda or something like that, if you have an opportunity to engage them, talk to them, and then thoughtfully answer any questions they have, maybe even going that extra step and providing them with the resources they need or, or giving them a direction to turn for more information. It's definitely a department-wide effort to prevent crime and help educate people on things they can do. So let's talk a little bit about perhaps one of the biggest events each year, which is the Night to Unite. It's coming up again here in August. Talk a little bit about what Night to Unite is this year. Well, Night to Unite, it's a statewide program sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Public Safety and the Minnesota Crime Prevention Association. Years ago, the title of the program used to be called National Night Out. We've got some, some organizations in Minnesota that sponsor it, and we've gone with the Night to Unite name for the last several years now. It's a community effort, and, and oftentimes it is organized by the local police department. They spearhead it, but it definitely goes past just the police department. It's an effort for people to get to know each other, to share together in their community and their responsibility for their community with all the different entities that come together to make a town or a city. And that's the neighbors and the people that live and work in that community. That's the folks that work not only in the police department, but also the fire department, city hall, and all the other uh, efforts that go along with city government. We try and have an event. Uh, and we choose this night, it's the, second, it's the first Tuesday of every August, which is August 6th this year, get everybody outside, have a block party. Um, during those block parties, you get to know your neighbors, you get to visit with people, and what we also ask is that people register those block parties with the city. They can do that real simply by visiting the Lakeville City website, and there's a link on there in which they register the block party, but once they do that, it lets all of us know that are coordinating the, the night to night efforts here in Lakeville that they're going to be out that night. And we try and make sure that they get a visit from the police department, the fire department, EMS, city officials. People can come by and visit with them. At that time, we get to know each other a little bit. Certainly, if anybody has any concerns, they can feel free to discuss it with us. 
And we also take the opportunity as police officers to hand out some of that prevention and informational type stuff for them as well. I think those parties are put on by neighbors, and, but there's also some businesses that, that sponsor uh, Night to Unite events. Talk a little bit about the, the effort that a, a person or a business might have to go through to, to put on an event. Well, we have all different types of parties in the city depending upon the location. The vast majority of them certainly are residential parties where one neighbor decides to host it, say, in front of or at their house. It's really more of a gathering. I don't think people have to go out and buy anything or do anything, although we frequently see barbecues and, and cold drinks and other things like that served as, as part of that motivator to get people together. But certain businesses also put on events at their business location. They put on different things uh, at some of the apartment complexes or multi-housing in the, in the city as well. The management teams put things together. So a lot of it depends upon where you're at. Um, but the concept is really not having a big splashy event. The concept is really all about just people getting that opportunity to be outside, interact with each other, and, and get to know each other a little better. And I've had a chance through the years to go to a number of these parties, Kevin, and I'm always amazed at a neighborhood party where people are introducing themselves to each other, where this event alone might have caused that new neighbor to come in and meet those that have lived there for a while. And I've seen people who have lived next to each other for a long time who are just finally getting to know each other. It's really part of crime prevention to do that. It is. Um, being a good neighbor is really one of the oldest and best ways of preventing crime and keeping your neighborhood safe. It's not about people being nosy and it's not necessarily that everyone has to become best friends with each other and deeply involved in everyone's interactions, but knowing a little bit more about who's where and what's normal gives everyone that sense of being able to understand better maybe what's out of the ordinary or suspicious. And then of course taking it that next step further to be able to call us in and let us do our job. So over the years, there's been a number of parties e every year. Can you give a little scope to the number of neighborhoods and businesses that take advantage of this? Each year, we have uh, generally between 100 and 70, depending upon who registers through the year, different parties in different locations throughout the city. So it's usually a really impressive turnout all across Lakeville. Uh, sometimes the weather has a little bit to play in it, but I think for the last few years, we've been blessed with some really good weather. And as uh, the city officials and the police department, we make an effort to try and visit every one of those parties, at least somebody, just to stop by and tell those folks, Thank for host thanks for hosting and uh, glad that you're out. So if somebody, perhaps we've tweaked some interest here today, if somebody is interested in hosting a party, how might they gather information and what kind of help might they get in doing that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The folks who have a party would like to register for it, they can get on the city website at lakevillemn.gov. Right on the front page, there's a link to register for you, your Night to Unite party. That is, uh, got some, also has some other information on there as well. If anybody has any specific questions about hosting a party, they can give my office a call at the police station, and they can call me at 985-4818, and I'd be happy to explain to them uh, anything that they uh, would like to know about hosting a Night to Unite party. Are there some resources that the department can provide then to somebody that's hosting a party? We generally bring out some handouts and some goodies for everyone who's hosting a party. And uh, it it's certainly uh, varies what we can have in the goodie bag each year, but we try and bring enough uh, handouts, treats, crime prevention information for enough people or for anybody who's going to be there at that, that event. So we'll try and bring them a, a big bag of support, supporting uh, items to help their party go a little smoother. It's really kind of amazing. I, I, you, you, you say it rather quickly, that's 75 to 100 parties. But when you start putting those dots on a map and you see how across the whole community people are coming together on that night, I think it's pretty impressive. And when you figure how many people come together at each of those parties, some of them have you know, tens or a hundred people, that number of residents that actually interact and have a chance to meet with us as city officials from all across the departments, that's really a good, a really a good thing. And it's, it's nice that Lakeville participates every year in this in August. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you for your efforts to bring the community together and create this sense of community through this effort and all the other things that you do. And, uh, and also thank you for being here on City Limits with me. Thanks for having me. Do you know about Summer Splash? This annual event includes a special tasting of craft beer, fine wine, distilled spirits, and food from Divine Swine and others. The event offers a silent auction and prizes to be won. This fundraiser for the Heritage Center is on Saturday, July 27, from 5 to 8 p.m. 
Tickets are $25 and you must be 21 or older to attend. Come out and support the new home for our seniors, veterans and history by attending this year's Summer Splash. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to the city's website at www.lakevillemn.gov. This is Louie the dog telling you, do not take pets with you in the car when you even go on quick errands. During warm weather, the inside of your car can reach 120 degrees in a matter of minutes. This can mean real trouble for your companion animal left in the car. Pets who are left in hot cars, even briefly, can suffer from heat exhaustion, heat stroke, brain damage, and can even die. This summer, play it safe by leaving your pet at home while you're on the road. Good human. <laughs> We remind residents that odd, even watering restrictions are in effect. In addition to the odd, even watering schedule, watering is not allowed between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. on any day. Fines will be imposed for non-compliance with the watering restrictions. I'm Jody Nordstrom here with Southern Notes. Today we have Drew from Chan Casco Winery joining us. Thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure to be here, Jody. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your history? My history? Well, um, I think I'm one of the few uh, Minnesota winemakers that wasn't born here. Um, I come from the central coast of California, Santa Barbara County. Moved out here almost three years ago uh, to help uh, design and, and build and be the founding winemaker at Chancasca Creek. People are always asking me uh, how we got the name Chancasca, and the simple answer is that the creek that runs through the property is called Chancasca, which is a, uh, a Dakota word meaning forest edged or forest enclosed. If I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me, are you guys located between Chaska and Chanhassen, and is that how the name came? The answer is no, we take our name after the creek that runs through the property. Very cool. Now if people are looking to take a day trip, what is the easiest way to get to your winery from the Twin Cities, and what amenities do you have there? Yeah. We're located in Casota, which is just south and across the river from St. Peter, Minnesota. So probably the best way to get there is just to take the 169 uh, out, of, uh, out of Minneapolis or Shakopee. And uh, when you get to St. Peter, you take, the, you take a left at the last stoplight, the bridge takes you across the river, and we're a mile down uh, Highway 22 uh, on the east side. We have a lot of different amenities uh, on the property. Um, basically, what you've got at Chankaska is a a Napa Valley style winery uh, plunked down in a, along a creek, uh, along a forest uh, in southern Minnesota. Uh, it's a 12,000 square foot facility. It's all built of uh, local uh, limestone, Casota mm -hmm. stone, uh, and distressed barn wood. Um, as I say, we've got a, uh, an underground temperature humidity controlled barrel storage room. Uh, we've got extensive outdoor landscaping. We've got a tasting deck uh, out back of the tasting room. Uh, we've got a tasting patio, uh, which has a, a fireplace. Uh, we do have food. We've got a wood-fired uh, uh, pizza oven, and so we do uh, fresh uh, handmade uh, uh, wood-fired pizzas. Uh, we, have, we have other foods that we can cook in the pizza oven as well. We do some wonderful steamed mussels. Mm. We have fruit and cheese plates. We've got cured meat platters. We've got free live music on uh, Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, if the weather's nice, we do that outside on the tasting patio. If the weather's not so good, we'll actually break out, uh, break open the barrel room and let the band and the people uh, uh, party in there. We have a variety of event spaces. We've got a large tent uh, that can hold uh, sit-down uh, wedding parties of uh, 200 people. Uh, we've got trails throughout the property. We've got little bridges going over the creek. We're a Minnesota farm winery. Uh, basically, that means we're uh, we're allowed to uh, uh, sell, uh, sell wine on Sundays, uh, which uh, um, most other uh, uh, liquor stores can't do. Um, we're also allowed to import up to 49.9% of our fruit uh, from out, outside of the state. Uh, and we do that. Uh, we make uh, uh, wonderful wines uh, from the West Coast. I make a Yakima Valley uh, from Washington State to Riesling and a Sauvignon Blanc. I make a, an ancient vine Zinfandel from fruit I get from Lodi, California. Uh, but we also make Minnesota wines. And uh, uh, hopefully we're doing uh, uh, excellent work with both of those varieties. Um, 
We make uh, over 18 or 19 different wines every year. We've got sweet wines and dry wines and dessert wines. Uh, we've got an underground, I think Minnesota's only underground uh, humidity and temperature controlled barrel room. So we, all of our red wines spend time in, uh, in actual barrels. We use a lot of Minnesota grown oak uh, barrels, uh, which is very exciting to me. We're, we're using Minnesota grapes and Minnesota oak barrels at a Minnesota winery, uh, but with a California winemaker. Cool. All four of these wines are available at all three Lakeville Liquors locations. Can you tell us a little bit about each one of these? I'll tell you a little bit about each one. The first wine here on the right is our Casota Rose. It takes our name after the town of Casota. Um, it is a blend of Frontenac Gris, Frontenac, and a little tiny bit of La Crescent. Uh, so it's a, it's a blend of red and white grapes in one wine. It's a, a semi-sweet. Uh, it has a lot of flavor intensity. It's very, very rich. I call it fruit salad in a glass. <laughs> very, very popular uh, with, uh, with women, uh, men as well, but ladies seem to really uh, gravitate towards that rosé. Uh, the next wine is our Reserve Marquette. Uh, we make a variety of Marquettes. I think uh, uh, every year uh, I get uh, Marquette from nine or ten different vineyards, and I handle each lot of Marquette separately and uh, uh, age them separately, keep them in separate barrels, and then when we get ready to bottle, I choose which barrels I think are the best. So the best of the best barrels go into that Reserve Marquette. Uh, it's won a number of awards. It, it recently just got a, uh, a gold medal and a best of class distinction at the Riverside International Wine Competition mm -hmm. in California. Very cool. Which is quite an honor for a, for a little Minnesota Marquette. Mm -hmm. The next wine is the uh, Petite Colleen. Uh, Petite Colleen is a fancy French word for little hill. Uh, I named the wine that because our vineyard is located on a little hill. <laughs> We've got six, uh, six different uh, Minnesota cold climate uh, white grapes planted in that vineyard. And basically this is a blend of every, of every white grape that comes off that vineyard. Uh, mostly it's La Crescent uh, with little bits of Brianna, Edelweiss, Prairie Star, Frontenac, Gris, and St. Pepin. Uh, it's a dry, crisp, very refreshing white wine. Uh, last year, the first vintage uh, got a gold medal uh, as well at the Riverside competition. The last wine in that, uh, that little frosted bottle, uh, that's what we call Frostbite. Uh, our Frostbite is a, a unique wine. It's a, it's a, a non-traditional ice wine. Uh, that is to say, we harvest the fruit when it's very, very ripe, uh, not when it's frozen. Uh, we then freeze that fruit down to about five uh, degrees Fahrenheit for about a week. I then hand load all those grapes into the press. We very gently and over about a 12 hour period, we press those frozen grapes. Basically what you're doing is you're freezing the water that's in the grape. And when you press a frozen grape, you get uh, a couple of drops or maybe one drop of, of liquid sugar essence. Uh, so I only get about a quarter of the amount of juice off of uh, frozen grapes than you get off of a, a non-frozen oh, wow. grape. We then ferment it very, very slowly, uh, partially in oak barrel, partially in stainless steel tank. Mm -hmm. And then when we're getting ready to bottle it, we fortify it with a little bit of uh, uh, triple uh, distilled grape vodka mm -hmm. to get the alcohol up to about 21%. So it's, uh, it's kind of like a sweet martini uh, or an ultra sweet dessert wine. Um, I like to pour it over ice and shake it like a martini and pour it mm -hmm. in a glass. Uh, it's almost too intense to drink all by itself. Uh, the best thing I do with the, uh, the best discovery I've made with the Frostbite is to use it as a base for a, um, a margarita. Use a, a measure of a good tequila, a measure of fresh lime juice, and a measure of the Frostbite, uh, which basically acts like the, the sweet and sour or margarita mix, and uh, we call it a Chancascarita. We just wanted to mention also that the Casota Rosé won Taste of Lake this year. For the, for the best uh, regional wine. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was a great honor. The, uh, the Casota Rose is, is uh, uh, an original blend we came up with. We're very proud of it. It's a very popular little wine, and it's winning a lot of awards. It got a, they got a silver medal last year at the uh, Cold Climate Conference mm. in St. Paul. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Jody. Look uh, forward to you coming to visit the winery absolutely. sometime. Absolutely. Now it's time for the answer to today's trivia question, which is, how many picnic shelters are there in the Lakeville Park System? If you guessed B, 22, you would be correct. 
These shelters are available to all residents to use during park hours, and you can reserve a specific shelter through the Parks and Recreation Department. More information about the Lakeville Parks can be found on the city website. Here's a look at some of the road construction that is happening in the city. The intersection of Dodd Boulevard and Highview Avenue is closed for the construction of a roundabout. In addition to the upgraded intersection, both Dodd and Highview will have improvements approaching the new intersection. Detour routes are posted and this project is expected to be completed sometime in late September. Another roundabout is being constructed at the intersection of 205th Street and Kenrick Avenue. The intersection is open to traffic, but expect delays in the area. This project is scheduled to be completed in August. Many of the streets in the Valley Park and Clays Acres neighborhoods are undergoing reconstruction. Drive safely in the work areas. Along with new streets, there are stormwater and utility improvements taking place. Expect these projects to be completed sometime in the fall. Here's a look at some of the upcoming public meetings that you can attend at City Hall. The Economic Development Commission will be meeting on Tuesday, July 23rd at 4.30 p.m. The Parks, Recreation and Natural Resources Committee will be meeting on Wednesday, July 24th at 6 p.m. The Planning Commission will be meeting on Thursday, July 25th at 6 p.m. And the City Council will be meeting on Monday, August 5th at 7 p.m. For more information on our government meetings and the role of our boards and commissions, visit the City website at www.lakevillemn.gov. That's it for this edition of Lakeville City Limits. Thanks for watching. If you experience a problem with your cable TV service here in Lakeville, you should first contact Charter Communications at 1-800-581-0081. If you do not receive a satisfactory response, you can call the city at 985-4407 and we will assist you in resolving your problem. And just a reminder, you can see all of our programming online on the city website at www.lakevillemn.gov. Thanks again for watching this program and all of the programming here on LGTV.